the Cosmopolitan and I'm Mo, your host. Everyone at the Cosmopolitan Globalists would like to thank all the authors who are contributing and who will be contributing all the submissions and the debate that those articles are generating. Let me introduce today's guests. Hello to Robert Zubrin and Gareth and Owen Lewis. We've got Casey Hanmer, who is with us today, Alexander Hurst, and Benjamin Wolf. We hope he's going to be coming as well. And our moderator, Ron Steenblick. Hello, Ron. How are you? Hi, very well. Thank you. Very well. Good, good, good. Just a word about the articles. And Claire's here as well. Vivek is listening in, but I do invite Vivek to jump in. Just a little word about the articles, just in case you've missed any. Casey Hanmer's article, Long Live the Sun on Solar Power and Renewables. Adam Garfinkel wrote on the futility of global climate accords. There was lots of discussion on that one as well. Gareth Lewis on three insights into the energy transition. Robert Zubrin, and I think your article's coming out, uh, Robert, for the climate case for nuclear power. Vivek is going to be writing something on the economic philosophy behind corporate behavior as it pertains to climate change. And Ron, energy and trade linkages, which has already come out. Owen Lewis, about the eternal promise of nuclear fusion. And I hope that comes out sometime. And Alexander and Ben's article, The Greens Worldview, okay, that triggered okay, a great debate, great discussion. Now, Ron, uh, you're going to be helping me, okay, to keep this conversation going, and Claire as well. And I'll step in, okay, with some questions as we go along. Now, Ron and Claire, let's start with two of you for a moment. Let's get the ball rolling. Why do you guys think that this issue of energy and climate change, why has it triggered such a debate? Why there's so many opposing views? Ron, Claire? Who do you want first? Whoever. Go ahead. Well, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, my brother called me yesterday and he said, who on earth are these crazy people writing you, writing you these letters? And I, I said, I couldn't believe it. He said, I thought the problem with Climate Week was that it was boring. So, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why. Why It excites passions, obviously, because the stakes are very high and getting it wrong could be catastrophic. But why people should be unwilling to hear polite, thoughtful exponents of different views, I think that's probably just, it's, it's, it's the direction our culture has taken. We, we no longer debate anything with people who don't agree with us. I think it's very healthy that we've done so, and I'm very glad that we've done, we're, we're doing this. And I think it's been a very good, interesting week. Ron, what mm -hmm. do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I've, uh, I've been working off and on in energy for, geez, almost of longer than 40 years, actually. And in a sense, I came of age in the uh, energy field about the time of the first, the 1974, uh, 1975 oil crisis. And at that time, of course, the, the main concern of policymakers was energy security. Several OECD countries had been targeted for sanctions, embargoes of their oil supplies, and, and that uh, provoked a big scare. There were shortages of, of gasoline in, in the United States and, and some other countries, which led to long queues. And, and so for a while, basically energy policy was driven by how can we ensure that we meet the projected future demands. You know, in the late 1980s, uh, scientists started to really ring alarm bells about the climate. And this was also at a time when there was starting to be some serious interest in uh, renewable energy but a lot of the technologies were still in the early stages and not large in terms of scale. So you had different mindsets from, from different generations. You also have people who have gotten interested in particular technologies over the years and have decided at some point that this is the answer. And naturally, when they see others coming along and, and, and make claims, they're, they're skeptical about those or are, are angry about the kinds of policies that have been taken that might make it more difficult for their favorite energy. And coming to the current generation, I mean, my son is, uh, is 27 years old. And, and I mean, I've been very impressed by he, you can tell that he takes the danger of, of climate change seriously. I mean, he hopes to, to live probably until 
close to the end of this century. And, you know, by that time, there's a lot of who knows what will happen in terms of the climate. So anyway, uh, that's just the beginning of why there's so many different yeah. divergent views on that. Okay. Now we know everybody that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The question is, and this Dr. X, who we would like to thank for his many comments in the comments section. And the question is how fast, by what means, and then what repercussions are those means going to actually create? So who would like to begin? Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, look, the primary energy crisis in the world today is we're not producing enough. The main problem facing humanity in the world is poverty. Far too many people in the world have inadequate energy, and that is the number one priority. Now, the, the environmental movement, so-called, is it, not really concerned with preserving nature. It's concerned with constraining humanity and providing a rationale for that and for other forms of oppression. You know, Malthus conceived of, of it in its current form. There aren't enough resources for everyone. Therefore, human aspirations need, need to be constrained and someone must be empowered to do the constraining. That is why intellectuals who espouse these ideas will, ne frankly, never lack for sponsors, and that's why they keep reoccurring. The bulk of humanity is doomed to perpetual poverty because they will expand to the limit of resources and then starve. The Darwinian said, well, there's a silver lining to that because the people who do starve are the inferior, and by letting them die, or as the eugenicist said, making them die, will improve the human race and make the world a better place. Nuclear energy emerging in the post-war period uh, aroused the ire of Malthusians because it offered the prospect of infinite resources. Although the Malthusian thesis had continually been refuted through the 19th century down to today, and uh, they mobilized for it. I mean, look, the Sierra Club published the population bomb in 1968. It was David Brower who arranged for that thing. It says oh, the world, world is facing a huge population crisis, so we have to let them all die. And then the Sierra Club opposed nuclear power starting in the 1970s because it was contributing to excessive economic growth and the population explosion, okay? And this was quite explicit. And the task before us today is to expand energy. Now, I do not agree that climate change is an existential problem any more than the population explosion was an existential problem in the 1970s as it was trumpeted to be. Their climate change is certainly real. The world temperature has increased by a degree centigrade since 1870, big whoop. Now, carbon emissions, are more significant, not because of climate change, but because of the change in atmospheric chemistry, which has been significant, 280 parts per million to 420 in 150 years. So we have to keep expanding energy availability, yeah. but we have to expand it in a way that does not continually expand uh, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere, not because of climate change, but because of atmospheric chemistry. And that nuclear power is the only thing available that can do that anywhere on Earth and at scale. And the hatred of nuclear power. You know, my background is as a nuclear engineer, and right. initially the environmentalists had been for it in the 60s, but then they turned against it. I said, why are you against it? You say you're against pollution. This produces energy without pollution. And then they said, well, we hate it even more than that. Well, why? Okay. Because it solves a problem they need to have. Well, exactly. Rationale mm -hmm. or programs to crush human aspirations. That, well, that is hold true. on a minute. I think Alexander wants to jump in here. Alexander? I just have to push back on a couple of things that have been said. But first of all, the goal of the environmental movement is not to constrain human flourishing. The goal of the environmental movement is to take into account that our existence on this planet is fundamentally a subset of the natural environment. Fundamentally, we exist within ecosystems and our ability to flourish as human beings is dependent on how those ecosystems perform. 16 centimeters of topsoil supports all life on this planet, okay? We're losing 5% of our topsoil every year due to industrial agriculture, other factors, but life on this planet is really fundamentally connected to the interconnectedness of all these ecosystems that we live within. So that, that's point one. The environmental movement is really about preserving the ability of human beings to flourish on this planet. Climate change is a much bigger crisis than you, you alluded to or gave it any credit for being because it is interconnected to so many different things. So the reason why we should be concerned about climate change, and I'm not gonna go through all the science. If anything, science scientists are relatively conservative in that they are, they are not prone to make outlandish claims uh, the whole basis of peer review is to try and find 
errors and pick holes in other people's arguments. We saw with the pandemic that actually there's a lot of reticence on the part of scientists to, to go ahead and accept something as fundamentally the case, like the airborne trans transmission of COVID. The, the WHO is relatively late to the game to accept that that was the case because they are fundamentally relatively conservative you know, people in the way that they approach their science. The problem with climate change is that it poses lots of systemic risks. If you say it's an existential crisis, we're all going to die tomorrow because global average temperature increases, that's really a uh, a straw man kind of argument. The problem with climate change is that it poses enormous financial risk. Sea level rise threatens tens of millions of human beings that live in coastal areas. When people start to move, that creates political instability. When the climate shifts and it shifts where food is able to be produced, where pasture lands are available for, for people who graze their, their cattle, that creates instability. So we have this culmination of risks in financial risk, political instability, population movements, it's the mother of all risk multipliers and uncertainty creators. So anybody who's a conservative in their approach to anything should want to avoid all of this unnecessary risk that we're about to thrust ourselves into a completely different ecological climate scenario other than the one that we've existed in as human beings for pretty much the entire the entire time we've existed in. Um, we can get to the nuclear stuff later. I'll, I'll yeah. save the time and let somebody else pick, pick up on sure. that. Sure. I think Ron wanted to jump in here. Ron? I found the characterization of environmentalist, which I consider myself one, very cartoonish. And just to set the record straight, the population bomb, which was written by Paul and Anne Ehrlich, they did not call for killing people or letting people die. They, they called for things like, on they, they called for birth control. Nope, they called for cutting off foreign aid to India to let them starve. Send us a link. AC, you wanna jump in? Yeah, sure, I, I think this conversation will be more productive if we kind of stick to the basics on energy rather than pointing fingers about who said what about why because with the energy stuff at least we can we can look to quantitative analysis and the first thing i'll say is uh, actually i've been a fan of dr zubrin since i was a, a young child and and i agree 100 percent and my realization as an avid environmentalist that there is no two ways about avoiding the fact that we need a lot more energy and that energy is not a bad thing and that oil for all its faults and its poison and its political entrapments and its tendency to introduce corruption to third world countries where it happens to be prevalent like Nigeria, it is also a necessary evil until we can find something better. The point of my article that I wrote for Claire, which was a little tongue in cheek, and uh, as I premised as such by saying that it's a minority report, uh, it's not necessarily <laughs> yeah. accepted by everyone yet, that we have in our power now the ability to generate huge quantities of energy extremely cheaply in ways that were not previously possible. And while I concede perfectly that uh, nuclear power is able to generate practically unlimited amounts of energy, and that's extremely interesting and very useful, particularly for space applications, the reality is that its deployment in the real world has never been faster than 7% per year increase. And by comparison, the solar power has never been slower than a 25% per year annual increase. And in the article, I delve into some of the structural reasons why that is. And I always think it's more instructive to look at things as they actually exist in the real world. And rather than kind of positing the existence of shadowy bogeymen that explain why certain things have gone slower or faster, you know, secret cabals of individuals and environmentalists this and the fascists that and all that, you just kind of look at, you understand what are the real structural technical reasons that underlie this particular thing. And the reason that, that makes sense to me is that solar is much, much cheaper to build and to build the factories that make it and to build the expertise around deploying it. And we see all over the world a huge explosion of the capacity and, and expertise required to deploy solar at an enormous scale. And it's actually even more solar deployed today than there is nuclear. It's just going way ahead. It's, it's, uh, its price and its deployment is outstripping everything else. It looks much more like something like Moore's Law than like the traditional stodgy, boring utility power providers, which have been you know, coal power plants since my grandchildren were little kids and the same conveyor belts and stuff kind of grinding away. That's the kind of centrally exciting point there. And I think if we can kind of focus in on the specifics of how we're going to go about getting a shitload of energy for a lot of people, we might have a, a slightly more interesting conversation here. What about the rare earths problem? Rare earths, it's a bit of a misnomer. My understanding is that rare kind of comes from a, you know, got these Latin words that use, used to describe parts of the periodic table. So rare earths are kind of off towards the left-hand side. They're actually not rare. They're extremely common. There are substantial reserves of them in practically every country on earth. The thing that's difficult about the supply chain is that extracting them from each other because they're quite chemically similar is resource intensive and often environmentally harmful if you happen to do it in a place that has no environmental controls, like China. And so China happens to have cornered the market, well, I mean, it's like 70 or 80% wise when it comes to extraction of rare earths, precisely because they can have enormous settling ponds and use environmentally harmful uh, processes. But there's no rule of nature saying that it's impossible to do this without harming the environment. In fact, I think it's probably highly likely that the less harmful 
techniques for earth extraction will prove to be more efficient and cheaper than the harmful ones, as we have seen in practically every other industrial process ever invented. Um, I just wanted to provide a quick number to back up what Casey was saying about solar, uh, which is that the price of solar has declined by 89% in the past 10 years. It's really an extremely surprising drop, especially when you look at the chart that compares the prices of generating kilowatt hour of various sources of electricity. Uh, in 2009, solar was $359 uh, per megawatt hour. Today, it, it's 40. You know, we get these responses that act like the environmental movement wants to enact this total totalitarian regime on the world where uh, we have governments dictating how people are going to have access to energy. It, it's the market that's been driving these extreme changes. You know, the energy industry is being disrupted in a very significant way. It's going to continue to be disrupted in a very significant way, not just in how energy is produced in terms of the sources of energy, the sources that are, that are making energy being produced, but in terms of how energy is being distributed, whether it's centralized production or decentralized production, energy being stored in batteries and vehicles, in school buses, for example, in North America, this is highly applicable to North America specifically, school buses have regular predictable times of use throughout the day, and they can otherwise sit in parking lots and act as a giant battery the entire rest of the day and in the evening when they can trickle energy back into the grid as soon as vehicle to grid technology becomes more widespread and more feasible. So when you're looking at all this stuff, we can't look at what the situation was in 2009 or even what the situation is today, the only way you're really going to have a handle on, on what's happening and how to be at the forefront of it is what is the technological horizon in about 10 years? And if we plan for that and conduct public policy based on that, those countries are going to be highly successful at capturing these really significant parts of the market. And all of this is going to produce an enormous amount of wealth. So really, if you're, if you're concerned about the market and about uh, producing prosperity in society, you want to be at the forefront of technological innovation. You don't want to get left behind. The companies that aren't grasping this are going to be left behind. The, the countries that don't grasp this through their public policy are going to be left behind. Well, okay. So the stuff that uh, Alex just said was inaccurate. Solar energy does not cost four cents a kilowatt hour. If you look at it, it, it has to, the stuff has a, a, a utilization factor of about 15% you know, solar energy on an average day is only available for about a quarter of the day. And if there's clouds, it's not available at all. In countries that have winter, there's a real problem with it. It has limitations. It has utility for sure. But the idea that solar energy can displace other forms of energy is, first of all, it was put forth by Amory Lovins in 1976 as a way of trying to head off the push for nuclear power after the oil embargo. And Secondly, it, it hasn't come true. Solar energy today provides half of 1% of humanity's energy supply. And by the way, solar and nuclear both emerged at the same time, 1950s. So this has been a horse race with equal. But the real question before us here is the question of the nature of man. Are we producers? Are we consumers? Now, the point of view that Alex put forth that we are parasites on nature leads you to the belief that human numbers, activities, and liberties must be constrained, and that the existence of every other person and every other nation is a detriment to you. And this philosophy can only lead and has led repeatedly to genocide. Please quote me correctly. We exist Humanity within nature. We are fundamentally dependent nature. upon the natural ecosystems with, within which we exist. A you can't be hyperbolic ecosystem. about things that other people say this, and expect no, to have no, a reasoned discussion. We do not discussion. exist within a natural ecosystem. Humanity over the past several thousand years, the past 10,000 years, has expanded its numbers a thousand times from a few million people to seven billion people because we create our own resources. Humans are not consumers. Humans are creators. I'd, li I'd okay, like I to think... jump in on that if I may. Yeah. Yeah, because I think there's something of a fundamental misunderstanding, like especially me, but also Alex, we are not at all advising to reduce the amount, number of humans. On the contrary, I completely agree that every human being on this planet can contribute to our common well-being and prosperity. And actually new technologies like solar, like wind energy, wind energy, but maybe also one day nuclear and maybe one day a very clean version of coal, gas, oil, whatever, will all help more humans to prosper on earth on other planets alex did not say that we are parasites on, on nature not at all it's rather that with human ingenuity we can leverage what nature provided us with but also what we create ourselves to create better lives for people all around the world 
and specifically Solite is true that it's only available for 25 hours a day, but it depends on the price, on the average price. You know, if it falls another 90% and you have batteries to back it up, it might be economically more feasible to build a lot of solar, to build some gas plants to back it up, to have some battery systems. Like Alex mentioned, it might be a way more efficient, way more prosperous way to organize the society. And that's where we see the opportunity. And I think if you look back, energy revolutions have always been a big step forward for humanity. We started using coal about 200 years ago. That was also an outrageous idea back then. 100 years ago, we started using oil and gas in a big manner and also electricity in its forms. Nuclear started about 50 years ago. So, you know, acknowledging that finding new ways of harnessing the energy from different forces that are around us, amplifying op our opportunities and our chances. And yes, of course, the right balance is important. And I also agree and that's, that there are some people maybe in the green movement who who are very much behind this idea of, oh no, humanity must scale back and we must consume less and we should not fly at all and we should not even have kids. But there are many people who don't believe that at all. That's not, Who yeah, are that's on the, the contrary main. saying mm -hmm. we should leverage these technologies to make life better for all of us and make mm -hmm. us more prosperous. Now, Casey wanted to say something, but he's frozen for now. Robert? Yeah, I'd like to read you a quote. And this quote is from a, a book called Global Ecology by Paul Ehrlich and uh, John Holdren, who later became President Obama's science advisor. They say the following, when a population of organisms grows in a finite environment, sooner or later it will encounter a resource limit. This phenomenon, described by ecologists as reaching the carrying capacity of the environment, applies to bacteria on a culture dish, to fruit flies in a jar of agar, and to buffalo on a prairie. It must also apply to man on this finite planet. Now, that is the core idea of anti-humanism. That is the view of man that this movement is promoting. And that is why it is not a good thing that you have movements like the German Green Movement promoting this as a substitute religion for young people because they need to have something to believe in, something to coordinate yeah. their spirits. Because what you're doing here is you're laying the idea, the ideological foundation for movements that are genocidal in nature. And I sent to many people on this list a, a book review that I wrote um, a few years ago of a book by Timothy Snyder. Snyder's book is very much worth reading because it shows the Malthusian roots of Nazi ideology. This is what is involved in this discussion. It's a view of man. This is not about whether solar energy is cheaper than nuclear energy. This is about whether humans are creators or destroyers. Because if you accept this ideology, the green ideology that humans are destroyers, and that, then the gates of hell are open. Well, okay, well... And this is all, the, the question of whether humans are created or destroyed is actually a tangent. We're here to talk about what's the best way of providing energy exactly. to 7.8 billion people. Exactly, exactly. Can I get Casey in here? Go ahead, Casey. Okay, first of all, I, I kind of agree that there's a, a problem. And growing up in Australia, I certainly encountered it, this idea that, you know, oh, there's a finite carrying capacity, we need to have fewer children. Even today, uh, amongst my friend group, that's, that's a not uncommon ideology, particularly espoused by people who decided not to have children for other reasons. But I, I also recognize that of all the major kind of existential risks confronted by humanity, the one second most important, I'd say, to becoming energy crisis, climate issues, and, and potentially nuclear proliferation is a population inversion, a demographic uh, collapse, due to the fact that almost no one voluntarily has children once they can afford not to. Second, there's actually numerous energy projects with solar and batteries that are currently being installed in the Los Angeles area with a combined cost of around three cents a kilowatt hour. Now, it's not unusual to expect that this technology will be cheaper in some places than others. It happens that Los Angeles is exceptionally sunny and has exceptionally good access to both markets and technology. However, as the technology improves, we will see it moving north and south uh, from the equator at about 200 miles a year at the current rate that we increase. And while it's true that solar power provides less than 1% of global energy today, it will, as it grows, uh, it's exponential. And I think after the last year, we all have a much better idea of what an exponential is than we did previously. And the final point I'd like to make is that I completely agree that Malthusian ideology is, is deeply troubled. The, the only thing really worth saying about it is that Malthus was born in 18, uh, sorry, 1766, which was about uh, during the same decade that the first industrial revolution began. And so his ideas were fundamentally correct up until that point. And since essentially the year of his birth been untrue. Ron? 
Yeah, I just, I don't understand why there's so much stress here on, on the so-called ideology of Greens when so much has changed in terms of the people involved, the motivations since the 1970s. I mean, that, you know, we're talking 50 years ago and yeah, there may be some people who, who feel like uh, Robert Zubrin describing, but again, I would say that it's a kind of cartoonish characterization of maybe some fringe elements of those who are actually concerned about making the world more sustainable. Germany is shutting down its nuclear power plants, uh, which it already has, which are already built. And by the way, whose cost of electricity is, the fuel cost is 5% the cost of nuclear electricity. Okay, they're doing this because of a political movement, an organized political movement that is, whose purpose is to deny people nuclear power. The nuclear power plants built in the United States before Carter produce electricity at three cents a kilowatt hour. But then they uh, initiated a campaign of organized sabotage against the nuclear industry in which they have caused the, the time to construct a nuclear plant has quintupled from three years to 15 years. And the cost uh, has also been multiplied five times over. This has been an organized campaign to destroy and deny humanity the benefits of a technology. Okay, the Sierra Club opposed the establishment of a nuclear waste repository in Nevada in order to create a problem for the nuclear industry. They weren't concerned about public safety. If they were concerned about public safety, they would not want nuclear waste stored near major metropolitan areas. They would want it stored in the desert. They made it impossible to store it in the desert in order to make nuclear energy less safe and therefore less attractive. This is an organized political movement. It's, it's not based on economics. And guess what? This movement does not exist in China, which is why they have plans to build 450 nuclear power plants between now and 2050. Okay. I don't know and if they're going to get that done. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> they're having a bit of problems even with the Belt and Road there. Yeah, yeah. let's invoke an authoritarian state. That's great. Um, no, no, no. I, no. I was. The, the, the problem here Please. has been a wrecking operation. You cannot deny that there has been an organized political wrecking operation against nuclear power. The Greens being parasites on the world and we want to totally decimate the human population to actually it's just a campaign against nuclear power. These are like extremely different things uh, no, that you're focusing on. That is, you, you don't want there to be infinite resources because it destroys the basis of your ideology. The basis of your ideology is finite resources. Robert, do you have anything against solar panels? I don't have anything against solar panels as a technology, okay? But the solar energy as a weaponized idea to dissuade people from doing nuclear power, which is how it was introduced, okay, by Amory Lovins and how it has been used ever since, okay? We don't need this because there's this solar energy. When in fact, I mean, you're talking here about humanity releasing a source of energy a million times more powerful than, than fossil fuels. I mean, look, the basis of technological progress is science advances to a certain point on the basis of that knowledge, a number of technologies can be elaborated. Once they are elaborated, you're able to make scientific discoveries that open up new forces of nature. Thus, humanity based on uh, wind, water, and biomass is able to initiate uh, coal and steam and steel. And that society is able to unleash electricity and chemistry. And that society is able to unleash nuclear power. And that each of these provide a quantum multiplier of what is possible. And the effort to shut this down, okay, and, and it has been concerted. And there is absolutely no doubt. I mean, anyone would have to be completely disingenuous to deny the reality of an organized anti-nuclear movement, which has done everything it can to sabotage nuclear power, to make it more expensive and less safe in order to cut humanity up off from creating this new source of resources. Hey, look, I, I, I'm glad we have such strong views on nuclear power. I think like any other source of producing electricity, we need to view nuclear power as a tool, right? Solar is a tool, nuclear is a tool, oil and gas are tools to achieve something which is providing human beings with energy so that we can increase our standards of living, 
grow our economies, achieve the things that we want to achieve. Nuclear power in its lifetime in the United States has been the single biggest energy recipient of US federal subsidies. It has received $150 billion in public subsidies. Oil and gas comes in after. Sol solar has received and all renewables have received a fraction of the subsidies that nuclear power has received. So it's not like nuclear power descended from heaven and was given to us by Jesus Christ or some other religious figure from other religions in history. You know, nuclear power is a very expensive tool to produce energy that requires a lot of public investment on its behalf. If we can produce energy with other sources that are cheaper, cleaner, less prone to producing catastrophic accidents, even if it's relatively infrequent, even if the next generation of nuclear power is safer, but of course that's putting our faith in the next generation of an unproven technology, just as putting our unproven faith in, in, the, in, the, in the next generation of solar and battery technology and smart grid seems to inspire a lot of pushback and skepticism, I would just be equally skeptical about the idea that unproven next generation nuclear power plants that are extremely expensive, like Flamonville in France, which is costing 20 billion euros and counting, that's more than the entire amount of money invested in solar energy last year in France, 20 billion euros and counting, to produce one next generation European pressurized reactor, is putting our faith in technology that in the past has produced catastrophic, disastrous results. No, Fukushima, Tr Fukushima, what? Chernobyl, Excuse Three Mile me. Island, solar, solar panels, solar panels have never- And the earthquake, not by nuclear- Exactly. And the last time that a tidal wave hit an area that was that had a large solar energy installation, absolutely nothing happened. So what I'm saying is that if we're going to pick and choose between tools that we have to produce energy, there's no reason to shut down existing nuclear power plants in order to replace them with coal. I am 100% on board from that. But if we're looking to the future, what are we going to spend our money on? Really costly things that might be made technologically obsolete 10 to 15 years from now that might actually have dangerous side effects like nuclear waste and be prone to producing really expensive catastrophes in the rare instances in which catastrophe strikes, or are we going to spend our money investing in the next generation of technology that is cleaner, cheaper, and safer overall? It, the choice seems pretty clear, and I'm a little bit flabbergasted at the, the sort of violent reaction that this seems well, to generate as if, as if nuclear energy proposing to, to decrease the amount of nuclear energy being produced on the planet is, is somewhat, or just investing in different forms of new energy is somewhat akin to pr promoting a genocide somewhere in the world. It's, it's really quite striking. Well, this certainly does, let's say, trigger a lot of emotions here. If we talk about nuclear, we're also talking about potential for nuclear prol proliferation in very ugly ways. Uh, we, we certainly do not want every country in the world to have advanced nuclear technology. It would be wonderful to live in a world where every country was in a state such that we bless you have the nuclear technology, but we sure don't want to want to hear from Iran, for example, that they really need nuclear power. So that's another another consideration that, and it's an important consideration too. It's a technical mistake. Both the United States and the Soviet Union had thousands of nuclear weapons before either one had a commercial nuclear power plant. And you can't use the fuel produced in a nuclear, commercial nuclear power plant to make bombs. Because if you leave fuel in a reactor for the length durations required by a, a commercial nuclear power plant, the plutonium-239 that is bred in the reactor, uh, up to 25% of it, becomes uh, turned into plutonium-240, which makes it unusable for bombs. In fact, the U.S. military would not accept any plutonium that is more than 1% uh, plutonium-240. So it's simply not true. So it's safe? Is this what we're saying? What I'm saying Very simplistically? is that the two have nothing do with each other. That uranium enrichment technology, yes, can be used to make bombs, but commercial nuclear reactors are not part of the bomb making process. How about the safety do of the plants themselves? Like well, well, look, since the 1950s, there have been on land and sea over a thousand pressurized water reactors, and not a single person has ever been harmed by a radiological release from a pressurized water reactor. reactor. Never. Nowhere. Not even in Fukushima, where three of them were wrecked certainly not in Three Mile Island, okay, which had a meltdown, and if, far from going all the way to China, the, the melt didn't even make it through uh, more than an inch of the, of the pressure containment vessel, okay? Fukushima, you have an earthquake and a tidal wave that killed 28,000 people from numerous causes. Not a single one was harmed by a radiological release from the plant. Not a single person outside the plant gate was exposed to any radiological release that was even interesting from a health point of view. Okay, if you want to protect people from Fukushima's, have better building codes. To, if you can, I don't know if any building code would have protected people from that tidal wave and the collapse of their buildings, but that would certainly do a lot more. 
But look, the main problem that humanity is facing in the world today is poverty. We need to expand energy production. And that means, I'll agree with Casey this far, that the choice of energy should be based on rational, technical considerations. Okay. Ron? Uh, yeah, I'd, re I'd really like to get on to other topics, but I've been living in Europe for, for quite a long time, and, and I, I used to be a desk officer for, for the Netherlands, and they had something for years called the Breda Maatschappelijk Discussie, which was basically broad social discussion. And they basically went out and they said, oh, we'd like to hear what everybody thinks about the future of energy. And this was in the 1980s, uh, 19, uh, early 1990s. And surprise, surprise, uh, the discussion said basically, oh, we want all this renewable energy and everything. Well, the government wanted nuclear power. Now, you have to ask, this was a democratic process. Who was right here? The government, you know, experts who, who really wanted nuclear power or the population that, that, that they were uh, consulting? You know, and, and in the case of Germany, there definitely seemed to be popular concern about, about the existing nuclear plants. Was that a good idea? I'm, I'm not going to say for them. And I certainly will not disagree that there are plenty of groups who are actively working against nuclear power. But, you know, to throw out policies that are in an authoritarian regime versus policies in democratic countries, I don't find that a convincing argument. But let, let me just build on something that Claire had said, that climate and, and dealing with greenhouse gas emissions is, is certainly an important thing is what we're here talking about. But Let's not forget that and associated with all this um, uh, fossil fuel combustion, of course, are a lot of other pollutants. And those pollutants are at the moment killing a lot of people through premature uh, respiratory deaths and, and, and other diseases. I'd like to hear from our representative from the coal industry. Anyone? No one came from coal. <laughs> <laughs> Vivek, you've been listening, okay, to the whole debate here. What are some of your thoughts? Okay. My submission to all of you is the answer to everything that you've been saying depends on how you frame the question. If you start by framing the question from what I would very happily call a conspiracy-minded uh, mindset against nuclear power, then we get come to a different set of answers. If we go to solar power and say that's ideal, we come to a different set of answers. I don't think that determines any answers in terms of what mankind's energy needs are going to be over the next 50 or 100 years. Energy needs are going to rise. And at the end of the day, what's going to determine the technologies that win are going to be two things. One, markets. The cheapest technology is going to win. And that's what's happened over the years with fossil fuels. In some ways, fossil fuels was cheap. All the negative points that came around nuclear power with politics and nuclear armaments and nuclear bombs and all that, that's again a part of the politics of uh, energy. But there are bigger questions at stake. If the world is going to move from fossil fuels to other forms of energy, how easy is the transition going to be? How swift is the transition going to be? Just imagine there are countries in the world like Iraq and Venezuela, which actually account for 70% of the fuel reserves in the world that are underground. All these countries are politically troubled. So what's the transition going to be? How swift is the transition going to be? How clean is the transition going to be? Because you can't deny that there's now a channel in the Arctic Ocean. You can't deny that the glaciers are melting. You can't deny that the oceans are warming and not just because it's not just a natural process. It's because they're absorbing more carbon from the air. So how are you going to manage that entire process? I think the question of what energy is ideal is great. But the question is, how are you going to manage the economics and politics of any sort of energy transition over the next 10, 20, 30 or 40 years? If we don't have those questions answered, all these debates on nuclear energy and the conspiracy theories for it or against it and are pointless, just pointless. That's my two bits. Okay, Vivek, thanks for that. It's a, it's a very, very important because this is what we're talking about as well, right? How do we transition over? Uh, Gareth has now joined us. Hi, Gareth. How are you? 
I'm well, thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Oh, no, no. Thanks for coming along and joining us Okay, in the, on this discussion. Gareth, you wrote about transitioning the three, if I'm not mistaken, your article was about the three insights, right, into energy transition. Mm -hmm. So I would like mm -hmm. you to comment, okay, on what you've written. Okay, uh, thanks, Monique. Very briefly then, and I'll just say right at the outset, regarding anthropogenic climate warming, I've, I've taken a deliberately agnostic stance uh, in the sense I call it pragmatic agnosticism. Regardless of what I think about it, it's happening all around us. Uh, it's driving energy policy. And uh, we just really need to deal with what's actually happening. The focus of my article was really to say three things that I see driving the green energy transition. And the first is the importance of transmission. So uh, very recently, Jennifer Granholm, the secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy, said, uh, folks, transmission is mission critical. So basically that means if you're going to have all this intermittent renewable energy coming into your grids, you're going to either have to store it so that you can use it when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, or you're going to have to move it maybe across continents to where it is needed. So first thing's transmission. Second thing is fossil fuels have to go, and that seems to be a big driver in the energy policy discussions and as soon as possible. And I foresee difficulties with that position, and I, I point that out in the article. And then the third and la last but not least is basically that this green ideology should drive energy policy globally. And uh, right now it's driving energy policy in the West. It is not driving energy policy in China, among other places. Okay. Oh, and you're also, also come in on this as well. How are you? Oh, good. How about you? Good. Very good. Very good. good. We've had a, a real, real heated debate here. Owen, what are some of your thoughts about transitioning? I think that the way things are going, that we need to try and find the best possible way of, um, you know, with the lowest impact on our economies of doing it. What's the best way of having abundant energy without damaging our economies too much as we move off uh, away primarily eventually from fossil fuel generation. And I know uh, that there's been a lot of differing opinions on that. In fact, Owen, okay, since we, I haven't read your article yet, so I don't know what you're going to be saying, but... <laughs> Are we apt to see any game-changing technologies that make these discussions obsolete? Well, I, I think fusion would be the game-changing technology that would make these discussions obsolete in some ways. Uh, I know that the late Stephen Hawking certainly thought so. That was one of his comments that, you know, if he could pick any one kind of game-changing breakthrough that would drastically change, uh, well, everything, really, it would be nuclear fusion. I know the ITER project in France, that's slated to uh, finish construction in 2025 and start plasma operations. It's not start slated to start actual fusion tests with deuterium tritium fuel, basically, for another 10 years after that, so mid-2030s. The, the expenses and delays, though, have made it part of why the whole phrase, well, th fusion's 30 years away, uh, away and always will be. But uh, there's a number of private companies that have cropped up recently who are making uh, significant progress in the States, in the UK in particular, but there's also a number of governments that are all on track to plan to uh, go net energy gain, so more energy out than it takes to power the reaction soon, some of them by the end of this decade, if all goes well. Yeah, this entrepreneurial fusion revolution, which interestingly was sparked by SpaceX, even though yeah. Elon Musk has no interest in fusion. But what Musk demonstrated that it was possible for a, a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things that was previously thought that only the governments of superpowers could do, and not only that, do it in one-third the time that it tends to cost and even do things that people have thought impossible, this has cut loose investment money for private fusion companies like TAE Energy in California has got $500 million, $800 million in investment. Yeah, they just got, they more, got some more, actually. More than the yeah. U.S. fusion budget. And... These people are not moving on a 2035 to our first experiment timeline. They want to be doing a fusion experience with just a few years in Commonwealth Energy in Massachusetts and Tokamak Energy in Britain and so forth. I actually worked in fusion in the 80s. I was at Los Alamos and I can remember one lunch, our group leader said to everybody, 
you know, when fusion is finally developed, it's not going to be at a place like Los Alamos or Livermore. It's going to be a couple of crackpots working in a garage. <laughs> and everybody just laughed because the, the machines are big and the crackpots aren't going to be able to build them. But if not a couple of crackpots in, in a garage, a startup in a warehouse, and this entrepreneurial spaceflight revolution, because of its success, is unleashed an entrepreneurial fusion revolution. And so I, I think we'll see certainly fusion ignition before 2030. That's fabulous news. Maybe we don't have to worry about any of this. There's still issues that we have to worry about. What sort of numbers will drive these industry cost structures? What about existing trillions and trillions of dollars that are there in sunk assets today around the world? There's a whole debate around this, and these the assets are being called stranded assets. So are these assets really going to be stranded? In that case, what happens to economies that are solely dependent without any sort of concurrent industrial or manufacturing or technological strains on energy sources that come from things like fossil fuels? How, how's all that going to work? How's the transition there going to work? How expensive is it going to be in the interim to switch to the new technology and then write off in your balance sheet, all the money that's gone into the old technology? Is that what we're talking about? Because that doesn't make sense at all. And if well, I can jump in on the economics really quick, there is a line of thought that shifting the energy system for the world is only going to cost our economies. It might cost some companies, but in an economy, my spending is your income. So, you know, all the investment, whether it's investing in fusion, whether it's investing in electric vehicles, investing in solar, all of this investment is going to produce a lot of wealth. And you see oil companies now in their, you know, investor day in from the fall, they had a large presentation outlining how they're planning in the long term and becoming a company much more like Iberdrola in Spain, which is heavily focused on producing renewable energy. And they're going to use their expertise in offshore drilling to start being an offshore wind producer. They're going to use their expertise in pipelines and in transmitting liquid fuels into producing green hydrogen and transmitting green hydrogen and using hydrogen as a way to fuel heavy trucking, shipping, and to store energy for transfer into electricity at a later date. So industries are going to adapt. There's going to be a lot of sunk costs that are going to have to be written off of balance sheets. It's also an area for enormous investment that's producing enormous amounts of wealth. You know, Volkswagen announced a large plan to greatly increase how many electric models they were rolling out and their stock price doubled in a, in a week. So there's a lot of wealth, a lot of economic opportunity that's being produced in all of this. It's not something that's only going to cost our economies. It's going to, you know, hurt economic growth in the future. It's going to propel a lot of innovation. Brian, you were talking about human flourishing, and we're producers, uh, not parasites or consumers, shifting the world's energy system is an enormous chance to innovate, to grow economies, to produce new technology. I, I've not been talking about it as a zero-sum game at all. I'm simply talking about the transition. And there's a great deal of politics involved in the transition as well. I admit that there's companies that are becoming the favorites of the markets and therefore they're going to invite a great deal of investment. That's not the point. That's a part of market behavior. That's the way markets always go. But in the interim, there's got to be a transition which looks at the politics of the whole thing. What happens to Iraq? What happens to Saudi Arabia? What happens to Venezuela? I think the simple answer is they turn into Mauritania. Uh, is that is that going to solve the world's problems or is that going to compound the world's problems? Well, there's plenty of countries that make a living without exporting oil. There's ways to make a living and not be in the oil business. Now, Vivek has brought up an interesting point, is that these new technologies do challenge existing invested interests. I'll predict for you that if solar energy really be, ever becomes a technology that can answer our energy needs at scale and attractive prices, there will be unleashed a campaign against it like you've never seen. And mm. certainly fusion energy as well. So the, the, the fundamental issue here is, is do we want to have a world based on progress or are we going to accept uh, these people who are, are, are trying to limit us? We all want a world based on progress. Anyone here? Not yeah, Ron? Yeah, I want to pick up a little bit on what Vivek said, because I do have the feeling that a lot of what this discussion has been focusing on is more the situation in uh, developed countries. But let me take you to, you know, South Sea Island, 
you know, when we're talking about uh, small scale energy supplies and so forth, a lot of small island nations basically depend on either fuel oil or diesel oil to generate electricity. And what's happening is a real revolution in energy supplies in places like that. Those are too small to run a nuclear power plant. So there's a lot of this kind of diffusion and development and deployment of renewable energy systems that's going to happen in places like that. There are a lot of places in, in Africa that are not served by very large transmission lines. And the World Bank for years has been studying this and said, look, in a lot of these villages, that really the way to go is to have some kind of small scale, preferably renewable energy source that we can install there and not build huge transmission lines to bring power from some centrally located place to serve this community. And that's one of the bottom up kinds of forces that's been helping to stimulate the diffusion of solar power and some of these other technologies. Now, in coming back to places where there is existing infrastructure, we haven't even talked about natural gas and hydrogen, and this discussion so far has been mostly focused on electricity, but there's a real kind of push and shove going on between particularly countries that have a huge natural gas infrastructure, like the Netherlands, who are very pro-hydrogen, mm -hmm. uh, and other ones that say, no, 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 we have to electrify everything. Mm -hmm.